and I'll say goodbye, but don't really go. I'm just saying goodbye for the thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> okie dokie. Hey, guys, good afternoon, Facebook. Good afternoon, YouTube. We are doing another live stream lockdown podcast, and I've got with me today David Marquet, who is the um, former captain of a nuclear submarine, uh, now best-selling author, uh, speaker, and, uh, and businessman. So as, um, as usual on these podcasts, we are recording it, on, uh, we're recording it live onto Facebook and YouTube, and we're recording the audio and the video for use on the podcast afterwards. So, if you've got any questions, if you if you guys are following it, then drop drop them in the comment box, and I will try and uh, I'll try and include as many as I can. Uh, but you know, just bear in mind that we're recording this for use afterwards. So I'll, I need to try and keep some chronology of order. But I will uh, I will speak to you guys where we can. So thanks for dropping by. Hello, Chantel. Uh, nice to see you are here. Um, right, David, you ready for action, buddy? Let's uh, should we do it? Rock and roll. Cool. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and today I have definitely got with me a first for our podcast. I have got the former captain of a nuclear submarine, David Marquet. Uh, David's kindly joining us all the way from Florida during uh, during lockdown now. Uh, and having having been the former captain of a submarine, David created a business called Intent Based Leadership. Uh, he's also an internationally recognised speaker. Uh, he's written an Amazon bestseller, which is called Turn the Ship Around which is a true story of turning followers into leaders. Um, and this was a book that Fortune magazine called the best how-to manual anywhere for managers on delegating, training, and driving flawless execution. Uh, and David's also got a second book out, which is called Leadership is Language, uh, which I will let him let him tell you about when we get going on to this. So guys watching or listening to this on, uh, you know, at home, on the podcast, on YouTube, on iTunes, etc. Uh, we are filming this live onto YouTube and Facebook. So we will include a bit of audience interaction where possible. Uh, make sure everyone gets best value. Um, so, uh, you know, everyone watching it in all your different ways, uh, forgive me, but I hope I hope I give you all the best way to uh, the best way to listen to what David's got to say. So, David, thanks a lot for joining us, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me on your show, Matt, and welcome everyone who's joining us from wherever you are locked down. How can I say how can I say no to having a summer a former submarine captain? Yeah. On? That is definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity. We're naturally. Um, uh, we, you know, our, this idea of being locked into a, a small place with a bunch of other people really doesn't upset us all that much. T -t -t tell me, I hadn't actually thought about this before we started recording, but now I've said it, I'm going to have to ask you. I mean, do, do, do you like the submarine movies? Like, uh, what, what's the one with um, with um, Alec Baldwin and Sean Connery? And, you know, Hunt, for, Hunt for Red, Hunt for Red October. October. I, yeah, yeah, it's funny you ask me that. I just finished uh, filming a piece with Business Insider where I, I look at about eight of these submarine clips and I, I comment on the um, on the realism of the movie. And we got it, it's over at the Pentagon now to get released for security review, but uh, I'll send you a link when it comes out. Hopefully it'll be about a month or two. Love to, and, and, and just as a generalization, I mean, how, how realistic are these things ever? Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you're a doctor watching some of these doctor shows, you'd be like cringing. Uh, so. In general, the the physics and the technology isn't quite right, but a lot of times the feeling of what it's like, like Hunt for Red October was really good at capturing the feeling. Das book, really good at capturing the feeling. And uh, now we got this new uh, series, the UK series called How to Be a Submarine Commander. And I, yeah, it just it's just out on Amazon Prime. I see it. And, and the 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 problem is again. It's perpetuating this this persona as a submarine commander, as a guy who gives a bunch of orders. And I found that it's really much more powerful if you don't be not to be like that. And this is the the big explosion that happened in my head when I went to be a submarine commander. Well, look, let's 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 talk talk a bit of chronology. Uh, obviously, I, I gave an introduction to yourself, but just uh, I guess you know I mean, we don't need to I guess go go too too deep into the past unless you think it's particularly relevant. But I guess you know t t tell tell us a little bit about you know life and the submarines, and then leaving leaving that to, to starting in business. And and I guess really at what point you realised that the the, the skill set you've been learning as as the as a submarine commander was was something that was you know, kind of completely parallel to business. And, and what took what took you over the uh, over the fence? Yeah. 
So my story in a nutshell, the one I tell and turn the ship around is I came up through a program where it was all about telling people what to do, giving orders, being clear and concise, and just your typical picture of what you think submarine commander would look like. And at the very last minute after I was selected and spent 12 months training to go to one ship, I went to a different ship, a different kind of ship. And that idea that I give orders didn't work. And in the past, like if you give an order and it's a bad order, you say, oh, I got to get better orders. That's my job as a leader. But since I couldn't learn the whole complexity of a submarine, I said, you know, what What if I try and let, let's create a system where I actually don't have to give any orders. And I made a deal with my team, my crew. I'm never going to tell you guys what to do. I'll never issue a, a command as the commanding officer. And it worked unbelievably brilliantly. And it wasn't it wasn't a change program like you would normally think. We just changed our language in a bunch of different ways. And so, for example, instead of the officer saying, well, I'd like permission to do this, and then I say, okay, do that. I'd like permission to submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, I, sir. We, they, we, they, we, I just said, just tell me what you intend to do. And if you say that, you already have permission. I grant you permission ahead of time if you use that word. So they would say, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. This is why, and this is why it's the right thing to do, and this is why we're how we're doing it safe. And then I would say, very well, or okay, and then they would do it. And so now everyone is coming to me. Rather than me trying to make stuff happen and then check on people, they're all leaning into me. You lean up. This is the problem. We all think, oh, I lean into my team. I direct, and they report, and I even call them my direct reports. So the whole structure of language in business is about coercing people to do stuff that you want them to do, which suppresses their thinking and their ability to get stuff out on the tape. And then we say, oh, well, do that better, and people will somehow think, and it, and it just doesn't work. We need to fundamentally change the language. And we had a, ran a whole bunch of experiments. We saw the power of language. Another example is we had all these days on the submarine, they by department, they by a hierarchy. I see this in business all the time. Well, they didn't order it. They didn't talk to the client. They did blah, blah, blah. And so you just say, no, you have to use the word we. Well, we didn't order the, and then you're like, eh. and pretty soon it feels like we, but the action comes first. We act our way. We use language to act our way to new thinking. We act in power. We use language of empowerment, and then we come and feel empowered. Not all these speeches that you give about empowerment or that you hear is just a waste of time. So stop doing that. Just act your way to new thinking. And this was the story. And so, uh, so now we help companies who are trying to do this. And that's what this uh, leadership, this, this new book, Leadership of Language, is all about. It's, it's what is the language. Here's the thing I want everyone to think about. Why do you use the words you do? And why do you phrase things the way you phrase them? Is it you deliberately chose to do it that way? Or are you just repeating words that you heard other people say or that you just grew up with? Because if that's all we're doing, then our language is industrial age language. And we never change it. And, and tell me, and not that I'm any expert in the slightest on military language and military strategy, but uh, I mean, everything you're saying sounds like, like, like you know the complete opposite of what you would expect in in the in the army stereotype. In, in, in you know, in, in any well, in any kind of military thing, it's all you know, you know, ah, you know, do this, do that. You know, yes sir, yes sir, no sir. I mean, I mean, how? how you're right. You're exactly right. So I flipped everything, and I, I talk about giving control, not taking control. I, I talk about things like, here's some very important words, I don't know. Those are so important for leaders to be able to say. And we say, oh, leaders have to know the answer, and then we get a certain outcome, and then we say, well, you know, we have to act in a slightly different way. But fundamentally, if we're anchored to always knowing the answer, then, then the, the outcome is never going to really change. We have to celebrate what we don't know as, a, as an individual and as a team, because that's what sparks our curiosity. That's what gets, creates learning organizations. As long as you're anchored in, well, I got to know all the, I got to pretend to know everything and everyone else has got to pretend to know. The, we all have, all we do is we have these BS conversations all day long. We're all pretending to know stuff. We don't really know what's going on. So I say, I don't know. Uh, and 
Uh, on and on, but but yeah, you're right. So it wasn't my training to be a submarine commander that I help people with now. It's my what I learned how limiting that training was. It, the training's okay. It'll take a team to from like so zero to sixty, but you won't get the most out of human beings by telling them what to do. That is clear. That science is clear. Only when people have control over the actions and they can feel safe to say what they think. Now you get a truly high performance team. And if you think if you think a team operating at level sixty is as is a, as high as it goes, I used to think, oh, I saw these teams are operating. Let's just call it sixty out of a hundred. But I thought it was a hundred. I thought it was the end of the story. There's a door. You open that door, you go from sixty to a hundred. It changes everything. And 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 how how did you find um, that your that your theories and your strategies were were taken up by by your peers? You know, I, I mean, and, you know, in terms of other other people in your position who who could implement it, or was it was it something that was shunned? <laughs> no, they they they. Well, the first thing is we didn't really deliberately have a plan. It, for me, it was desperation because I was giving orders based on a different kind of submarine, which would have got us in trouble. So we were just trying to figure it out on board. And it wasn't a program that I could go talk to people about until afterwards when I wrote, wrote the book. So they, they knew like what happened with my ship. We went from the worst performing ship to the best performing ship. And we went from having the worst morale to the best morale. We went from only one in 10 sailors signing up to stay in the Navy to every single one. Now people said, oh, how did that happen? You must have given really good orders. And I would say to them sort of briefly, no, actually, I stopped giving orders. It's the opposite of what you think. And they're like, huh? And, and it's just they couldn't see it because it was so foreign to the way they were thinking about leadership. We, we, we like the idea that there's leaders and followers. Why? That's just made up that there's white collar, blue collar, that there's thinkers and doers. That's all made up by humans in order to keep people in coercion, keep people complying with what they're supposed to do and not make it too hard for me to explain why I need you to do it. And, and, and this is, these were kind of the light bulbs that kept hitting me over and over. Why do we run the meeting this way? Why am I keeping a list of, of, of what you need to do? It's crazy. We waste so much time managing humans. They, don't, they need to be coordinated. But not but, but but tell me on, on that though, in, in terms of that, you know, that specific language you, you just used, you know, you said, you know, it's it's a fallacy that there are thinkers and there are doers. I mean, yeah. I mean you, you have to agree that at some point, you know, that, that that a certain proportion of people are not thinkers. You know, they, they, and I'm not being disrespectful to them. You know, they they just are doers. I mean, how how would you anticipate managing them any differently? Yeah, I, so for, for me, it's always a bell curve. So if I would say, like, here's humanity, and there's pe people who like to think and people who like to do. People just like to be told what to do. So it's always, there are some people who really are uncomfortable. But the problem is it's what we do to them that pushes, it pushes more people into the doing than we need to. And if we create an environment where it's okay to think, I, what we saw was those people who before you would say, yeah, that's just, just to do. He just wants to be told what to do. They're that, they're that way because of the way we treat them, not because of the way they're fired. Anyone who's ever had a two-year-old knows humans are not do what we're told kind of people. And then we have an education program that's got 12 years to beat all that out of you so that you go to work to be a nice compliant member of society and you do what you're told and you sit at your desk and you have the right answer and you raise your hand when you're called on to ask permission to go to the bathroom and and how much i mean i guess obviously in your situation on the, on the submarines you know m many many decisions you know were very much life and death i mean i mean how, yeah. how how much latitude in the thinking are people given? Or, or is it that, you know, you allow people to think, but they then still run it past you? Um, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's what the idea of intent is. I still get to veto it. Okay. So, so the way, another way to think about it is, in most organizations, the person at the top, think the CEO, their MD, 
They've got a gas pedal to say, go, 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 launch the product, develop this new thing, talk to the clients, give it discount, shift into, pivot into something. Else. And then they have a brake pedal. No, no, hold on a second. And what I tried to picture was, I want my team to have a, the gas pedal and, and the brake pedal if they need it. All I want is a brake pedal. Because as soon as I start saying, look, we should do this, we should, and you can go through all these corporate scandals all the time and you can see how they get misinterpreted. We need to be able to diesel engine that has this much performance and these sort of emissions levels. Well, you know, so I, I'm coercing the team into doing that. It requires cheating, but the team is coerced in, into doing it. And that's the power of leadership. So at the top, all you want is a brake pedal. And here's why. Once you are part of the decision, once you say we should do this, you become contaminated. Your brain then attaches. It's like a virus. You attach ego to the decision, and then it becomes harder for you to actually see the decision in a dispassionate. See, it's not. You know what? We should stop selling. Uh, stop renting DVDs. That doesn't make sense anymore. We're going to stop doing print film. It doesn't make sense anymore because you're attached to the decision. So what you want to do is is it's called the decision maker and the decision evaluator. And you want to separate those two roles. And the way you do it is by never making a decision. Let your team make all the decisions and they're all pushing forward. And all you're doing is saying, whoa, every once in a while. And that becomes an organization where there's this bias for action. People have ownership and their commitment and they're making stuff happen all the time. That's the difference. Okay. Interesting. I like it. I like it. And, and I, I think I think for me, you know, what's what's really interesting is is the kind of you know the complete you know what one eighty of philosophy you know from from someone with your background. I mean, you know, in in uh, I guess in business in date you know in normal day to day business, you know, there's always let's say revolutionary business business thinkers or, or or new management styles. But but you never think you never think it's too crazy because you know I, I guess not, nothing can go too badly wrong with these people and and. and and uh, you know they, they get like a testing ground, but um, you know, and, you know, to hear these strategies, you know, coming from someone like, like you know, literally dealing with life and death, and you're d dealing with a with a military that is so uh, you know so historically black and white, and and and, and order takers and order doers. It's a, it's, it's very very interesting to hear. Yeah, that's why it works. I mean, we, we work with clients all over the world. We were working with a company in France, and they make bottled water. And yeah, if you have impurities, you could you could hurt people. But I was at a meeting with the senior executives, and the, and some of them were like, "Oh, I don't know, blah blah blah." And the guy stands up and says, "Look, this guy did on nuclear. All we do is water. <laughs> it's like we can do this." Well, but our fears hold us back. Our fears always hold us back. And, and and the cool thing is, it's inside us. It's not gravity. It's not the laws of physics. It's not a piece of technology. It's simply our own fears and programming, which hold us back from being just really amazing leaders and amazing people, which help the people around us. Well, listen, I want to talk a little bit about crisis management. Uh, and you know, for, for anyone listening to this, after, after the date that we filmed it, just to kind of contextualize this, we're recording this on the 4th of May. So we're kind of, you know, five or six weeks into lockdown. And we're, you know, we're certainly a couple of months into, into Corona, COVID, you know, call it what you want. And, uh, you know, we're still, well, I'm still hearing from many, many business owners on a, on a weekly basis of, you know, of their problems, their, you know, their crises, their, their, their lack of cash flow, etc. Uh, and you know we're undoubtedly in what is you know what is probably you know, the the worst event that 90 percent plus of businesses you know unless they're selling groceries and toilet roll uh, you know it's, it's it's probably the worst uh, economic circumstances any business owner has, has ever um has ever had to had to um feel but uh, I mean, obviously you know you your your crises are, are, are slightly different you know f uh, from you know should you or should you not launch the missile i guess you know is this decision going to you're know, going to kill other people kill my team i mean yeah. what, what kind of parallels can you can you give people as advice today? And you know, what kind of strategies for crisis management have you got, both both as a manager and also as someone, uh, I guess, someone taking orders, if you like, from from someone who could effectively be making them walk to a certain death. Yeah. So the the characteristic that you want in your organization we describe as distributed decision making, but unity of effort. So people 
all through the organization can make decisions. They don't have to be channeled up to the person at the top and then come back down. The problem is people say, okay, well, that's going to run in tension with getting everyone on the same page. I can order people to mark, march and lockstep so I have unity of effort, but I don't have distributed decision-making or I'll let people walk across the bridge any way they want. So I have distributed decision-making, but not unity of effort. Well, it turns out you're going to have both. And in crises, people say, oh, now this is the time to take back command and control. The difference between a team which can just can make act can act independently in small groups, individually making decisions how to deal with something, versus one that has to ask permission all the time and get someone else to make the decision, is even greater in times of crisis. So our, our clients, people who we've worked with, they built up this muscle where people are can make decisions. They make decisions during the normal time. Business is all about solving problems. And I got this client here and they're this way. I got a client over there and then this way. I got a video course, but it doesn't really, uh, can we do it in some other way? There's, so we have, so medical groups adapting to using the PPE, changing the way to do business. If we have to wait for someone sitting in headquarters to tell us how to rearrange the entry room and then make, this doesn't work. Nonprofits restaurants, whatever it happens to be, the more you can get thinking and decision-making happening way at the edge of the organization, then, and then the faster and the faster your organization is going to adapt to what's going on. And since we live in a global world, if you're in Northern Italy, maybe adapting means one thing, but if you're living in Florida or someplace that's not hit as bad, maybe adapting means some, something different. So the fact that some giant head person at the top is going to make all these decisions just holds you back. So this is the number one myth is that in crises, we want to go back. The reason people go back is because they haven't trained their team. The team is not a thinking team. In general, they have to rely on someone telling them what to do. So in a crisis, it just exposes all the cracks and it's even worse. Teams that have built up independent thinking, decision-making people throughout the organization thrive in this in this time and are, are you are you specifically advising any people right now du, du, during the uh, during the covid situation yeah well we have all we have all our uh, we have clients that that we're engaged with now and then we have previous clients so for example one of the biggest meat producers in in the united states and what they're doing to take care of their people and they're they're having to change the way the assembly line this is not work you can do from home Mm. You got to go to the fat. You got to go to the plant, and so the way they're pr protecting their people, setting up barricades between people, plexiglass. So I can see the person, but it, that if they sneeze, it won't come over to me wearing masks and that kind of thing. Uh, me uh, medical uh, organizations, nonprofit that we're working with, and uh, on and on and on. A big. Um, a uh, food producer in in a headquartered in Switzerland, and but but basically it's the same. It's exactly the same story. It's the teams that have built the muscle memory for people to make decisions are still making decisions and they're still doing well. We got one client. They say we don't pay the most, but we're the number one in in our industry for this kind of talent that we're looking for. We're the go to company because people know when they come here. They can make decisions, and so we we doubled in the last year. We've doubled our staff, and this doesn't happen. I, if you're just going to say, "Well, people are going to come to me because I'm going to pay them more," you're competing with Facebook and Google. You're probably going to lose. And tell me, I was I mean, we've we've talked in the context uh, of, of your books and your theories of you know how, how to be a better leader, how to how to be a better manager. But um, I mean, a, a lot of my audience as well are you know let's say currently em employees in small businesses or, or you know thinking thinking about you know starting a business on their own. What 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 kind of advice uh, could you translate this to of almost like how how to, how to be led better? You know how how to, how to be a better follower. Yeah, so it's all about safety, and we and when as a leader, I got a CEO calls me and says, "Hey, my people don't speak up in meetings," 
And I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, I order them to speak up. I'm like, well, I think there's, like my hypothesis is there's some way that you're running the meeting that's making it hard for people to speak up. No, 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 I order them to. Well, well even that language gives me a clue. That's the way this person is thinking about human beings. It's all about safety. We need to make it safe for people to speak up, but it also goes the other way around. If you, if you want to earn voice with your boss, you need to make it safe for them to listen to you. And it comes by not challenging their authority. Now, I'm an expert in this because I did this wrong for a long time. I would go to my boss and say, hey, I think that was a dumbass decision you just, <laughs> you just made. Or I think we can do, you know, even if you don't say that, I think we can do it better. And, they, and what they're thinking is, oh, you think more better than me. So now you earn the right to be heard before you influence the decision. So the first is, hey, uh, this is your decision. And you make sure that you they know that you under, understand that's their decision and you respect their authority to make the decision. Don't challenge them. Hey, it's your call. Whatever you decide, I'm going to support you 100%. Would you like to know how we see it on the team? Not how we think you should do it. That's too, that's too many steps up the ladder. All it's just about description what do we see what are the factors hey would you like to see what uh, like to know what we see the factors are here would you like to come down and look at the code would you like to come down and look at the product would you like to, just how do you see it and they'll say okay sure it sounds it's very safe you're not challenging them and then you earn the right hey would you like to know what we think is going on would you like to know what we think what we would do if you weren't here would you and again fun, most fundamental choices would you like to know yes no they can say no I would say no 10 times, get a new job because it's never going to change. But yeah. generally speaking, if you're doing it right, then you can you earn the right to be heard. Then you earn the right to influence the decision. Cool. I like it. I like it. Well, listen, I mean, it's been great, great to have you here, David. And obviously, you know, I'm looking forward to getting your books myself and, and certainly, certainly, hear, um, you know, learning more and hearing more about uh, about your theories. But um, uh, now's your chance to kind of tell everyone where, where we can find you. you know, where, where should people be following you on social? Where, where can they buy your books? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, thanks again for having me on your show, man. It's L, like you see below, L. David Marquet, no spaces, uh, Instagram, Twitter, the handle's the same, LinkedIn, say hi on LinkedIn. And uh, our program's called Intent-Based Leadership. So the website, intentbasedleadership.com, you can check out uh, on LinkedIn, the Intent-Based Leadership Institute. And the uh, first book is Turn the Ship Around, then Leadership is Language. Let me know, let me know what you try. Oh, we, can get those books on, we can get those on Amazon or anywhere yeah. we normally buy our books from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any normal bookseller will have both those books. Cool. Well, listen, thanks again, David. It's been been great, and uh, I hope, uh, hope we can see you again in the future.